So I, I wanted to just introduce Fungible uh, to this audience. Um, and really we'll start with our mission statement, right? Fungible's aim is to, to effectively cloudify the data centers in the world by util utilizing our data processing unit or DPU to connect resources in the data center, right? Whether those are CPUs, all flash arrays, other assets, right? And, and um, over ethernet is a key, a key piece of this and, and we'll get into why that's important. Uh, a, a bit about our background. Um, we've got kind of a deep bench of expertise and our founders, Pradeep Sindhu and Bertrand Serlay, um, who started this company in 2015 uh, and really saw an opportunity uh, to do what I described in the mission statement um, to really level up the, the, the performance and the efficiency of the data center, right? And that takes many, many forms, right? Whether that's agility in terms of cloudification, obviously our, our enterprises and, and um, technologists over the last 10 years have been trained in the public cloud to expect things, you know, at, at the stroke of a key or, or the execution of a script. Uh, and so agility is critical. Um, performance and utilization um, ultimately drive to, to economics, right? And, and what's the total cost of ownership? Um, so that was really the mission starting off. Uh, the, the technology then evolved into uh, a, a purpose-built chip, which we call the data processing unit, the fungible DPU. And it's a purpose-built microprocessor um, that's targeted specifically at what we call data-centric workflows. Uh, and we'll get into what that means. Right, um, we, and we've got, so the DPU was born um, and, and now we've proceeded and, and continue to build systems around the DPU uh, to help with this, you know, deliver this mission of, of composing assets in the data center. Right? Um, we've been around six years. Uh, Eric Hayes, our CEO now, uh, is pictured there on the left as well. He joined us last year. Um, and we continue to, to build a world-class of people. Uh, there's a slide on our investors um, as well. And, you know, a, a, a bit more about sort of our perspective on the industry. And if you, if you rewind uh, a little bit, you know, the CPU has been evolving for the last 50 years. It's a huge market. Um, and for many years as we came out of the mainframe era into the, the CPU era, you know, lots of applications and technologies have been converging around the CPU as a general purpose processor, right? And I think 10 to 15 years ago, we started to see that diverge again into purpose-built processors. GPU is a great example um, designed around, you know, uh, batch compute, uh, floating point computations. Um, we've seen the emergence of flash memory over the last decade, decade and a half. Um, all driving really large industries and, and markets, right? Um, but, but Fungible saw kind of a gap in that evolution and that was particularly around data management, right? And so that was really the goal of the Fungible DPU and the design principles behind the, the Fungible DPU is how can we accelerate and drive efficiency in in data centric workflows. And, and particularly, I think that the fungible DPU targets, what we might call big fast data, right? It's not just a lot of data. It's not just about moving the data quickly, but it's that combination, right? And so um, that the goals, the, the kind of two goals around bringing that agility that you might find in the public cloud back into the private data center, uh, as well as a focus on data centric workflows, um, requires something special, right? And in, in, in our opinion, and the, the DPU can deliver transformations on this data up, up to 20 times faster uh, than CPUs or GPUs. Um, and, and that makes sense because we've optimized for that, right? We've built a chip that accelerates things like encryption, things like erasure coding, right? And, and then it also allows us uh, to, to focus on scale out infrastructure, right? And, and that, that delivers a couple of benefits. One clearly is the efficient pooling of resources. Um, this is not something we invented for sure. You know, shared storage has been around a long time, but the benefits are clear, right? Um, you can drive better utilization of an asset like Flash by pooling it and, and exposing it to multiple workloads. Uh, of course, we can't forget about security. Um, we're in a, an increasingly risk 
risky world in the digital world uh, and in the physical world. <laughs> but, uh, and, and so security has been designed into uh, not only the DPU, but the systems that we're, we're, we've built and we continue to build um, from the start. This is just a picture of sort of the stack that, that Fungible has built and, and continues to evolve. It starts at the base layer uh, with the, the, the DPU, the data processing unit. And this is silicon, like I said, um, custom designed for, for data centric workflows. We actually have two DPUs. One we call the F1, uh, which sits in our uh, a storage cluster. Uh, and then we've got a smaller one called the S1. Uh, and if you, you kind of trace that up above, you see that sitting on a PCIe card, right? And so there's two implementations. It's the same chip architecture. They're just uh, different scale in, in terms of the size of the chip and, and throughput. Uh, on top of that DPU, we've built an operating system, which we call FunOS. And that allows us to talk directly to and invoke those um, accelerators and, and functions um, of the chip. <clears throat> On top of that fun OS layer, we've built infrastructure software uh, to cover things from virtualization to security to network and storage um, and so on. And then uh, we've got control plane software and host drivers um, to be able to access and communicate with that infrastructure. On top of that, um, we, we're building systems, right? And so this is what we're here to talk about primarily today um, it, it, in Storage Field Day is our scale-out storage solution, but also how that fits in with the bigger vision of Fungible. Um, we've also, like I mentioned, implemented our DPU and a PCIe card that is now uh, combined in a storage solution, uh, which we'll get into and, and actually demo today. Uh, we've We've just launched our first uh, GA version of a storage initiator. It's not a required component to use our storage, but it does help offload NVMe TCP from the host um, and give back some CPU cycles to that host, uh, making it easier and, and more performant as an overall ecosystem. Uh, and then kind of right across the top of everything um, is what we call our composer layer, our data center composer. Uh, and this is really our control plane not only for the storage system, but for all of fungible systems. So that's kind of a snapshot of the stack that we've built. And like I mentioned, we're, we're continuing on that vision of... Um, so Toby, do you consider yourself a, a composable infrastructure supplier or a storage system supplier or both? Yes, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I think we're both, right? I think today, um, what we're shipping is is primarily um, storage, right? Because that's that's our, our most mature product. Um, but the the long term goal is is much broader than storage. Storage is a key component of any data solution. Um, but I think, in terms of focusing on delivering data at higher performance levels, more availability um, to be able to. It's not just about that storage and, and performance of the storage. It's about how can we expose that data to drive business value, right? And I think so that grows the vision larger into a composable, disaggregated infrastructure. Company. I would say most most of the composable infrastructure vendors we talk to are you know PCIe switching kinds of things rather than having embedded um, smarts. I'll call it you know security virtualization those sorts of things that you guys are providing in the DPU. So it's, yeah. it's, and so those sorts of things sort of sound, smell like storage sorts of work rather than, I don't know, GPU composability things and that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So are you changing the DPU to supply or support for these other, I don't know, infrastructure component kind of things? No, actually, we're, we're not changing the DPU. Um, the, the DPU, and Jay will get into to how this works uh, in a lot more detail, but the DPU was designed from the start to support a variety of operations, right? Um, the, the first application or solution that we came out with was a, a scale-out storage cluster. Um, but the DPU can... It, it's built in a way to be programmable, to, to build all of these different infrastructure data paths that are on the slide here, right? And so as we continue to deliver systems, we're, we're actually, uh, I'm not gonna let the cat out of the bag, but we've got an announcement coming up in the next, um, say month or so, uh, that'll be another step along the way towards um, a, a more full vision of 
delivering that composable disaggregated infrastructure. Um, we're not just bound to storage, right? I think I think there's a lot of components um, in delivering disaggregated or composable infrastructure across the data center, and and storage was just the first one. Toby, I have a question here uh, about uh, you know the longevity of these cards. I mean, mm -hmm. it's true that these you know. Uh, DPU brings a lot of advantages today, but uh, we don't know how many years uh, it lasts in terms of, you know, the next generation of GPU, GPUs, whatever standard components mm -hmm. will bring more to the table. CXL. So, huh? CXL, whatever. So things change very quickly. So how do you protect the investment of your customers? Yeah, that's a great question. I think... Um... We, we really view the DPU as a, a new socket in the data center. We might say like the third socket, right? Um, and I think in, in that framework, that the ability to target specific workloads around data management, data analytics is gonna be around for a long time, right? We, we talk about the mainframe and how that's gone away, except that it hasn't quite, right? And the CPU, right, we've diverged from a single, single processor to, to accelerators, and, and there's been a divergence of all these things. But we, we feel like the DPU is going to be here for a long time. Um, we're continuing to evolve the architecture to keep up with emerging standards, you know, the next PCIe Gen 5 um, and, and other things, right? So I think there's there's a path and, and we're, we're on that path to continue to evolve the capabilities of the DPU, but, but the focus of it um, I think we're squarely in the middle of, and I, I might use that as a transition to my next slide, right? I think these are the, the infrastructure challenges that we're seeing, and, and I think everyone's seeing, you know, um, in the data center um, and, and just in technology in general, right? That workloads have diversified radically, right? That um, no longer is it enough to have a web server sitting on top of a MySQL database, right? We've got applications that were born in the cloud, born to be online, you know, SaaS, PaaS, infrastructure as a service. Um, and in each workload has particular demands, right? And so general purpose infrastructure doesn't always meet the needs, right? I think on top of that, and this really supports my last point and answer to your question, we. We've seen this exponential growth of data, and that's only accelerating, right? And you know, maybe uh, another version of Enrico's question is how you know the, we've seen in the past um, ASIC-based storage solutions come out, mm -hmm. and it takes them a long time to update to new functionality. You know, whatever it is, fiber channel sixteen gig versus eight gig or four, you know, whatever. Um, how long? How? Let, you know, how, the question I really want to ask is how long does it take to spin the ASIC? Or is the ASIC you know, functionally programmable enough that you don't think you'll ever have to spin it again? I, I can't believe that. <laughs> yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let me just add. Yeah, so first of all, we will have, and we do have a roadmap for the ASIC. We will be continuing down that road. We don't think we have to spin it all that often because we are so far ahead of the curve. But yes, there is definitely, uh, more silicon coming. With respect to the speed with which you can write functionality, uh, I'll show you a chart, the speed with which we have added, for example, storage capabilities, which you'll be very familiar with when you see. And you'll see the rate and pace at which we're able to add new function is in fact very competitive and very similar to what you can do with a storage box built with an x86 processor. And in fact, this thing is programmed in C. You know, it's, it's, it's not like I have to do unusual things. In fact, some of, the, some of our guys tell us that in some ways it's actually easier to program on this thing versus uh, standard x86. So, um, so yes, there will be a roadmap. Uh, we will bring it out as we need it. I mean, we already are supporting 200 gig networking speeds. Actually, our F1 chip is 800 gigs. So, you know, we're already kind of ahead of the curve here. Um, yeah, but CXL but as right we need it. the corner, or PCIe 5, PCIe 6 and, is coming out. And, you know, and our next version is also not far away, uh, you know, to, to support uh, PCIe Gen 5. 
I have another question at this point. So there is the hardware component and this is the software component. So the optimization that you have on top of the hardware. I mean, so you can't use the hardware without you know the necessary components on top. So how much of so usually you release the hardware. I mean, this is what happens usually. And then you know there is some time to to catch up with the you know software on top of it. So uh, how does it happen for you? Yeah, so the architecture is not, when I, I'll get into the DPU architecture, you'll see that the architecture remains very similar. That is, you've got a bunch of cores and you've got a bunch of accelerators. The way you write the software is all very, very similar. So we already have two chips. The code that we built for the F1 chip just ran on the S1 chip when it came along. So it wasn't like I suddenly had to change a bunch of stuff. And how much, uh... You know. And so when, let's say, a follow on to one of these chips, we'll call them two, F2 or S2, you know, these things will continue to run because the architecture remains the same. You just have to speed up things. You have to go to, you know, from Gen 4 to Gen 5 PCIe, CXL, you have to continue to evolve that. So it's like a general purpose processor than a specific IO card that would have you need a new driver every time you use it. No, but it's, it's that's got right. hardware security, hardware encryption. It's got you know hardware interfaces uh, built in. It's it's not just a CPU. It's not just a generic CPU. I don't know. I know what's in the chip. All right, we'll but, show I mean, you obviously there's the a CPU we'll of some type in the, in the chip, chip, but there's actual there's a hardware bunch of, functionality, right? There is hardware, but it's um, but you know the the hardware is very carefully chosen to be. Um, not at such a high level that you know you have to make significant changes to it. So it is things like erasure coding. Erasure coding is erasure coding. You know, it kind of works the same way. You just have to do it faster. Compression will have to do it faster as as we evolve. Um, but you'll see our numbers today. You know, as as Toby said, I mean, look, I've been building storage a long time. You know, and it's really hard to get a million IOPS from a, from a storage box. This thing is already doing 13, 14, 15 million. So we're so far ahead that we will, yes, we'll, we'll, need, to crank, we'll need to crank the chip, but um, we don't have to do it as frequently. We already have a roadmap. The next stuff is already in plan. And the software will, will just, because the architecture doesn't change the way we're doing it. Yeah. How much, uh, you know, uh, so if, if I think about potential applications and uh, I, I think about service providers, hyperscalers, the kind of guys here, I don't know if you have customers in this area, but, but actually how much of this, you know, architecture is, uh, can be customized for my, I mean, is it a standard architecture and I can do anything or can I optimize for my workloads? to, uh, you know, uh, detect you're, some patterns. You know, I think this is one of the things that make our DPU very different than other DPUs. I'll tell you this, because you essentially have what I call a programmable data plane. Um, you know, typically you have, you have a bunch of cores, you have a bunch of accelerators. If the thing you want to do exactly is what the accelerator is doing, you get great performance. If the thing you're doing is not that, then you don't get so great performance. In our case, you'll see that um, we go from core to accelerator to core to accelerator in a way that's very, very programmable. And so if the thing, let's say that it's TCP today, but we got some customer that wants to do the quick protocol, not TCP. Well, that's all very, very possible and programmable the way we build it. So it's not like I, it's not like I build this thing, it does Rocky, and now I can't do anything else with it. That's not the way we've built it. So that's a very fundamental difference that I, I really want to, I can't emphasize enough about that difference between us and other, other ASICs, other DPUs. Yeah, our ability to evolve the capabilities of the chip are fundamental to how we built it, right? The fact that it is programmable, um, then it is flexible, um, that we can program a pipeline in software actually makes us faster to evolve to new standards, right? Um, and, and we've taken a standards-based approach in, in terms of the systems that we're building. We chose NVMe over TCP as a standard, right? Why? Because that's emerging. We're seeing 
converged ethernet networks everywhere in the data centers. Um, it doesn't require any upstream switch programming like Rocky does. Uh, and so that was a standard that we chose and, and that continues to, um, to drive our design principles. Uh, I'll leave you with this kind of vision, um, a little more pictorial version of what I shared before, right? In the middle is the, the, that converged ethernet network. And then you've got servers that are DPU enabled, whether that's a, a CPU server, right? I think in, in our world, a server really is just CPU and RAM and everything else can be composed into it. <clears throat> um, we've got SSD servers, which are really the same server with, with, uh, with storage composed into it. Um, we've got DPU powered servers that might do other things, other types of accelerators, um, purpose-built servers for AI analytics. Again, all these resources can be composed um, over the network um, using our DPU and the technologies we built around the DPU.